I'd like to invite to the stage Admiral Mike Rogers. <laughs> hey, thanks, Rob. Bye. Thanks. Have a seat on the couch. There you go. Great. So uh, I think suffice it to say you've had a pretty good journey so far in life. Been very fortunate. Very fortunate. Yeah. So uh, maybe we can get the mic to work this time too. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to. I want to start. We're gonna. We're gonna go into I think three buckets. And we might stumble upon another bucket that we hadn't thought about, which is fine. No but plan survives contact, as we say. Yes, times. exactly. That was von Moltke the Elder. <laughs> Great. So um, one is we're going to talk a little bit about cybersecurity. That's something you've spent a lot of your career in. Didn't start there, but right, right. it was a hot zone and you moved into it. Uh, then we're going to talk a bit about making change happen in complex organizations. And few are more complex than the military intelligence complex. <laughs> And then finally, uh, your personal transitions, your personal life and how you see your vision for the future, which we all grapple with on a regular basis. So let's start with, let's start with cyber, the dark side sometimes. Yeah. Um, what are the big trends that you see, things that people in this room should right. be concerned about? So first, I am an optimist by nature. Um, and one thing I try to point out to people, if you step back, I think the digital world to date has proven to be more resilient in many ways than the physical world. If you look at major storms, events, traumas, in those physical settings, we see recoveries, resiliency taking months to years in some cases. In the worst cyber event globally to date, I would argue not Petya in June of 2017. So Remind us what that one's. So not Petya is the name given to a malware that the Russians had developed that they had initially targeted against uh, institutions within the Ukraine, except the methodology they used to spread this malware didn't recognize geography or just a unique target. Right. And suddenly this malware was proliferating around the world. Um, and even that is probably the biggest event we've ever, we've ever had in terms of global scale, cost, depending on what source you want to use, estimates from the low billions to upward 10 to 100 billion dollars. Um, but even that, recovery was days to weeks. Hmm. We haven't experienced to date, knock on wood, um, the same kind of challenges in recovery that we have in the physical world. I, I, I'm, and I'm an optimist about that. I think that's a good indicator. We've got attention, we've got focus, we've got a willingness to commit resources. The challenge is though, that's great, except what if what is taking you days and weeks to recover is something that's critical to whether it's your everyday personal life, whether it's whatever the activity is associated with the organization, whether it be a business, a government, a military, whatever, days and weeks can be fairly significant. So you can't argue that there aren't implications here. I don't mean to do that, but I'm not a doom and gloom. The sky is falling. If you look at the broader trends though, I would argue you get a couple things coming together. You got increased complexity of the actors out there. They're just getting better and better. And it doesn't matter if it's a state actor or in many cases, non-state actors. If you look at some of the social engineering that you are seeing to attempt to get you, us, as users to believe that what is being presented to us is legitimate, reasonable, and I right. should access it. If you look at the amount of work that goes into that, the engineering, not just technically, but trying to understand you as an individual, as an ecosystem, what do you value? What do you focus your time on? What are you going to be susceptible to? What are you comfortable with accessing? And that'll vary by individuals. What one person feels very comfortable with, oh yeah, this is a subject I care about. Another one would go, clearly it wasn't intended for me. I'm not interested in that. Um, so you're seeing increased capability. You're seeing increased partnerships and relationships. You're starting to see nation states engage with non-state actors, in some cases exchanging actual tools, giving them capabilities. Is that, a, is that a cyber equivalent of war by proxy? I mean, it, part of it is because you want to confuse attribution because having been, you know, worked with our government and government counterparts around the world, everything starts with attribution. If you do not have confidence that you know who or what and why, Right. It's very difficult to generate a response yeah. and to generate a policy um, in terms of what you're going to do. That becomes really difficult. And then technology itself, hyperconnectivity, good things going to help us in terms of our day-to-day -day life. But as an individual, not only defended networks for multiple decades in the service of our nation, but also penetrated 
networks. I would tell you that makes the attack surface for the attacker, gives you a whole lot, a whole greater set of options. It makes life easier for you. And then we're betting on several global integrated solutions. Cloud is a good example. Not arguing cloud's a bad thing, yeah. but nothing, if it's, as I used to tell people, if it's designed by man, it can be defeated by man. So don't think for one minute that there's nothing that's beyond potential. It may yeah. take a lot of time, may take a lot of resources, um, but if an entity, nation state, non-state actor, if they really want to commit to something, they got a high probability they're going to succeed at least accessing it, which is one reason why access, we need to make systems harder to penetrate, but we also need to come up with a strategy that says, despite my best efforts, the odds are there's a high potential I'm going to fail, and therefore I need to think about resiliency and recovery as yeah. core aspects. Well, now the cyberspace, which you, uh, you transitioned into, how many years ago approximately? About 50, about 20 now. About 20, about 20 years, years ago. So that was when it was really kind of, there was some very basic things at that time that were happening and, and now it's a fully different world. Yeah. Um, the way we respond and engage has had to change. Um, what do you think has to change about how America and our allies are treating these cyber issues in the future? I mean, are we, what's our scorecard? Are we at a, a B plus, A minus? Are we, oh my gosh, we really got to circle the wagons or the ships, I guess? I think so. The positive side is we've got strong recognition. And as I always remind people, look. In other words, we, leadership says right. we get it. Without recognition, you cannot solve a problem. Uh, and I can remember earlier in my career, you spent a lot of time having what I thought were fairly basic arguments about, look, there's a challenge here. We gotta commit resources, focus time, energy. We gotta be willing to do some things. I think part of this is cyber forces you to get out of your comfort zone in the sense that cyber doesn't recognize geography. Cyber doesn't recognize these boundaries we've created between what is a government entity and a government function versus what is a private as an individual or private in terms of a company. Cyber just doesn't recognize these boundaries, right. and yet we have created constructs over time where we often use, in the military, we love defining problems by geography. It's why we have a central command that works Afghanistan and Iraq. It's why we have a Pacific command, an Indo-Pacific command in Honolulu that works the Indo-Pacific region. It doesn't respond well to geography, and this idea that the government can do its own thing and the private sector can do its own thing, I think is a pretty flawed approach to doing business. I think the challenge for the future is how do we come together in a much more integrated way? Yeah. And that's not an insignificant challenge in a democratic society. Right. In Let's which talk the about role... that. These, these worlds are colliding. Yeah, yeah. And there, by the way, there's nothing we can do about that. We can, we can pretend, we can act, but they are going to come together. And so what can we, what can we do to help that synthesis be most effective for protecting our democracy? So first, we can have an honest discussion as a society about what are the implications here. I mean, at times... that's not happening? Well, it's not happening as much as I wish it did. At, at times, for example, in my previous life, I, I would get some in the private sector would tell me the answer is engineers need to run everything. And I'm going, <laughs> are, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, Likewise, I would say the idea that you think the government is going to do this by itself, why, number one, that's not going to work. Number two, yeah. in a representative democracy, why would you want to do that? Why would you default to the government's going to run all this? Uh, yeah. Like, I don't think that's going to work. So we need a broader, honest dialogue. And it's got to be a dialogue that's driven much more by fact and much less by emotion. And the, uh, you know, some of the discussions you've had earlier today. Right. So how do you do that in a world in which increasingly truth, yeah. objectivity, um, a willingness to actually dialogue, engage, becomes more and more difficult, both from a technical standpoint, in terms of fake and the right. technical beliefs, but I would also, for us broadly as a society, we are incredibly polarized right now. It becomes more and more difficult to just have a civil Conversation. Can you think of an example, Mike, because you, you, not only in your role, but you entered the role of director of NSA, commander of Cyber Command, at a pivotal moment in the history of our intelligence community. Things were, things were tough. There were some public relations nightmares, based, by the way, undergirded by some issues. And, and leadership said, Mike, you're the guy. So, <laughs> so you're forced to. So I had that in, going for me. Yeah, exactly. No one else wants it. Here you go, Mike. So what. 
how did you address that? Give us an example of something you were able to do or see happen to generate an honest dialogue or an engagement of some sort. Well, it was, it was kind of interesting. Now, two organizations very, very related different. in the sense that they have aspects of the mission there was some commonality. Yeah. And yet, one was a very traditional military organization, about 80% uniform, about 20% civilian, had a very operational kind of focused mission, offensive and defensive. Right. The other, you know, largest intelligence organization in the US government, about 65% civilian, about 35% military, focused on using cyber and other things as tools to gain knowledge and access to help generate insights to serve our nation. Um, so one wants to potentially uh, do some things and doesn't have a problem with the fact, hey, I want them to know I'm doing it. The other is, I don't want anybody to know what we want to get in. Right. We want to do what we need to yeah. do. We don't want them to know that right. we're Which there. Which is the natural act for the intelligence community. Right. Um, so you don't have a little difference in, in cultures. Yeah. One's not good and one's not bad. They're just different. Um, they were two different places in their organizational lives. Cyber Command was relatively new. When I got there, it was four years old. Okay. Um, and was still, we, in fact, we were still growing. We, we, it wasn't until the end of my time, my responsibility was operationalize it, build it out, get it ready to assume its responsibilities, which is what we did when I, when I turned over. And it finally got to its current size as I was leaving. NSA, on the other hand, much more mature organization. It had been around since the 1950s. 1952 or something yeah, like that? Yeah, been around since the 50s. Um, and I decided with the one, I think we've got a good plan, we're in the midst of it. We need to focus on execution. Let's tweak it as we go along. But the fundamental plan, I think, is a solid one. Now we need to focus on execution. On the other one, on the NSA side, I, I said to myself, guys, look at, look at what's going on in the world around us. We got amazing technical change in the telecommunications and IT arena. We've got a society that we serve that increasingly is suspicious of institutions. Yeah. Um, has very valid concerns about what is the role of the government broadly and specifically the intelligence structure of that government. What's its role within our society? What should I be comfortable with? Right. Um, you put all that together and my view was if we keep doing the same things the same way, I'm not sure we're going to be successful. And I define success as both the ability to generate insights that lead to better policy and better operational outcomes for our nation and our friends and allies. But the other thing I said was success to me was a society that is comfortable with who we are, what we are, and what we do. What does that mean, a society comfortable with who we are, what we are, and what we do? So the idea that, hey, we as a society are willing to cede some level of authority to you to serve in our name, to defend us in our name. Okay. Realizing that we, citizens, there's 300, approximately 335 million of us here in the United States, as well as our friends and allies around the world, not every one of those 335 million is going to have awareness, is going to be able to shape or direct. In, in some ways, there's a big deal of trust. Hey, we're going to give you, right. through the legal framework, through the law, through policy, we're going to give you authorities in our name to serve us. And we want to make sure that we believe in what you're doing and how you're doing it. Right. Um, and that's very important. I always said, look, if you want to do intelligence in a democracy, welcome to a tough world. This isn't Moscow, it's not Beijing, right. it's not North Korea, it's not Tehran. The structures that work for them would never be acceptable. Give us one system. example of how we've got to do it in, a, in, a, in a, an elected democracy. So, what, what oversight mechanisms? So, if you look at what we created, the US government, in the, 19, in the late 1970s, coming out of acknowledgement that intelligence organizations and the US government use their capabilities to monitor U.S. citizens, right. their approaches and views on the, civil, on the Vietnam War. Um, you know, that's we, been going on for a long time. Right, we stepped back and said, whoa, wait a second. This is a massive abuse of the authority that we as citizens granted to these institutions. A series of the Pike Commission and a few and the Church Commission uh, led to both uh, investigation, series of hearings, led to some fundamental changes. We created the FISA court, a judicial organization that granted authority 
Um, we created oversight committees in the Congress for the first time. Right. What is the SISI, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, the HIPSI, the House Permanent Select Committee. That was a solution a while ago, and it, and, and it was a solution to the problem at the time. Right. Is that the right structure? No, fast that? forward now. Yeah. So as I'm looking at this, I'm going, so our oversight structure is largely predicated on the premise that our citizens are comfortable with these institutions acting in their name and truly representing their interests. How does that work in a society in which institutions are increasingly not trusted? Wow. So we built a strategy wow. that worked the question. <laughs> you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, when we created it, is that still the right structure for today and the world we're living in? Um, so that led to decisions like we need to declassify more things. We need to, some of the FISA warrants and some of the processes we put in place, we physically released all that. Now you redact some of it because we don't want individuals, specific targets, but we want citizens to have a level of, ah, so there is a structure. There is a set of checks and balances. It's not just you get to do, Rogers, you can do whatever you want. Right. It was never that, never that way. Does, i play devil's advocate sure, for a sure. second. Does that rigor put us at a disadvantage against those who do not have those kinds of value-based constraints? The way I always phrased it, and this was true when I was much more junior, I can remember at one time I was a, a captain, a colonel in the other services. I'm a naval, I was a naval officer, and I was hired by the then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to be his, think, his he told me I want you to be my strategic thinker, and I'd never worked for him before. And I can remember in the aftermath of 9-11, as we were thinking what ultimately became Iraq and Afghanistan, um, I said to him one day, sir, I, I'd only give you one thought, and that is, if in the name of security, we become something we are not, and we forget our values and what it is that made us, then the other guy has won. Yeah. I don't want us to forget who we are and what we are. And so that means at times, as a, you know, that means at times as a democratic society, there's gonna be more pain for us. It yeah. means at times we're not gonna do some things that potential adversaries are very comfortable doing. In fact, right. they're, they're doing on a regular basis. I don't think that the inference then ought to means, well, we ought to become like them. That is not the conclusion that I believe is applicable for us. So I wanna pick a little bit on this question about how do you drive change at a large organization, because a lot of people in here have that remit. Right. But I want to point out first that the, the, the gentleman who initiated the applause, Guy Philippe, is a cybersecurity expert from Europe. So maybe the two of you want to chat uh, later on. Uh, so Mike, you're, you're, you're in this new role. Big change is required, you mentioned, especially at NSA. What's something you learned about the process of changing a very large, well-established organization? So number one, I, I didn't fully anticipate how do you drive change in an organization that feels we're great at what we do. We're fully compliant with the legal framework. Because even in the midst of all this, we had multiple, President Obama directed multiple independent assessments. They all came back with the same fundamental conclusion. NSA is fully compliant with the law. NSA has a rigorous structure in place to protect access in terms of information we come across and how we use it associated with US individuals. I'm not gonna argue it's perfect, but all of the reviews came back and said, you fundamentally have clearly put a lot of time and thought into how do you try to protect Which is a great actions. outcome, but that doesn't, that doesn't satisfy the naysayers. Well, right, the now. The naysayers are gonna say nay. I mean, what do you do? So my view is, so the workforce is telling me, sir, we, we had these independent right. reviews. They yeah. love, right. they're comfortable with what we're doing. Yeah. Sir, we are really good at what we do. They're yeah. making movies about what we right. do. <laughs> and I'm going, have you ever looked at what the tone and tenor of some of those movies are, for example? Right. Yeah. Guys, I'm not comfortable that that's the right answer. Um, the second challenge I found was everyone loves change or many people are comfortable with change until it involves them. Right. And then it's, whoa, wait a second. That does not include any of us right. here, of course. <laughs> I thought so this was about you, somebody else, not right. about me. Right, right. So what do you do about that? So number one, education and communication becomes a big, big deal. Um, number two, you try to get the workforce involved in this. So it's not, uh, it doesn't come across as, so this is Roger sitting in his office in the big blue cube at, at yeah. Fort Meade, up on the top deck. And in your environment, they have no idea two years from now you might be on a different mission or, right. you know, just like in the private sector, who's going to be the boss in three Check. years? I don't know. 
So, um, you know, I, I, it was the part in some ways I enjoyed the most. Because um, as NSA, we had not had significant changes in terms of structure at the time we did this in almost 20 years. Wow. And I'm going, guys, if we were a private entity, if we were a business and we hadn't changed right. in structurally, focus, yeah. orientation, culture. We'd be out of business. I said, right, we didn't make a change in yeah. 20 years? And I said, guys, this includes big events like 9-11, terrorism, massive changes in, in technology. And at its heart, you know, I said, look, we're an organization that harnesses the power of technology to defeat technology. That, that's what we are. Yeah. Um, so I always found it was an interesting challenge. So give us an example, an anecdote, a story of some sort where the light went on for somebody or an organization or, or the perspective change, something that happened, uh, a, a colleague, somebody working with you, uh, maybe, maybe your own light went on at some point. Give us an example. So when I first got there at the time, from about 2012, excuse me, from about 2010 to 2016, the intelligence budget in the United States was going down, was decreasing. And as we're trying to figure out how we're going to do what we need to do to serve the nation in a declining uh, budget structure, I can remember that when I first got there, I'd been there a few months, I get the budget presentation for the coming year. And I always told everybody, now the budget should reflect our strategies and our priorities. Okay, because the workforce wants to make sure that how we spend our money is aligned with what we say. Right. So tell me what our what you think our our value proposition is. And a con consistent theme I kept hearing from the leadership team was, we value the workforce, we value people. Mm -hmm. As I got the first budget presentation, and we're declining, so we've got to cut some things. Uh, among the areas targeted was training, education, travel. And I said to the workforce, those are three things that they really relate to. Mm -hmm. They want to grow in skills, they want to grow in experiences, and they want to be able to occasionally not be sitting at wherever the location is. They, they want to come to Twin Global. Right. Of course. So yeah. whether it's things like Black Hat, DEF CON, yeah. right. RSA, right. look, they want to get out and about, right. they want to interact in this ecosystem, and yet we're saying we value our employees, but we want to spend less money on them. I said, I don't buy this. Mm -hmm. We're not consistent. Um, and it was interesting. I got, well, we didn't really think of it that way. And I said, well, how do you think the workforce is? Right. Don't worry about me. How do you think the workforce is going to think about this? Because if I was one of our line employees, that's exactly what I would be thinking. Were you able to make the case? So, yeah. So then it became very, ah, sir, we hadn't really thought about that. Let's, so I just said, hey, let's go back. Let's look at some other options. Let's take risk in missions that don't have the same level of priority. Not all missions yeah. are the same thing. There's right. some things we really care about. And there's other areas you care about it, but you're willing to spend less money on it. Right. So that's what we got to do. We got to take a risk-based approach. So speaking of priorities and what you care about, you've had a monumental transition. <laughs> I, I, I think it's safe to say you did pretty well in your military career. <laughs> um, you retired from that uh, with honors. You transitioned out. How do you re-envision your life, your career, your position in, in the world, and what's that looking like to you? Right so now? for me, is I really like like a year and a half out, right? Yeah, about a year. Yeah, hey, about fourteen months, fifteen. Fourteen, months, fifteen guess. months. Okay. Um, so I left in June of last year, June of eighteen. You know what I, I tell my sons and my wife is, boy, how fortunate is your husband and your father for only the second time in his life? Because I did the military, I did the navy for thirty-seven years. Um, for only the second time in my adult life, I have the opportunity to step back and ask myself, what do I want to be? Who am I? I said, man, you just don't get that all that often in life. I viewed it as a real opportunity, as something energizing, not, oh my God, life's going to be different. I'm not going to be a four-star admiral anymore. I'm not going to run these big organizations. I'm not going to be in the White House or on the Hill or you know, yeah. dealing with foreign governments. I said, look, that's not what that was about. This is an opportunity for me to think about what the future is. And for me, some of the same things that shaped my decision to go in the military, yeah. money wasn't the big, it was never the biggest factor for me. If it was, I wouldn't have chosen that life. Um, as I entered this new organization, I said, I think some of the tenets of that previous life can be applicable in this new life. Focus on mission, caring about the people that I work with, understanding the value and the culture of the organizations that I potentially am going to become a part of. And I always tell people, look, if we don't get the first three, three things correct, mission, people, ethos, and culture, I don't even want to have a discussion about resources and compensation, because if I don't get the first three right, I'm not interested. Um, and so using some of the same methodology that quite frankly shaped my life in the uniform world, I have found 
has, has led to some interesting areas for me. Finally, I, I came to two other conclusions. After 37 years serving the nation in uniform, I'd like to kind of step away from the government and DOD. Um, I, I'm very grateful for the opportunity, but I'd like yeah. to try something else. Um, secondly, I don't want to work for one organization. I like the idea of continually growing as a person, learning, uh, getting to meet new people, do new things. I find that very energizing. Um, and then, you know, lastly, you got to acknowledge I lived in a cocoon for 37 years. I'm very proud of that. I loved what I a did. A really, really big cocoon. But right, I, I lived in this big cocoon in many ways. It has its own culture, its own ecosystem, its right. own view of the world around it. I said, look, you got to acknowledge it. As you start this new life, you got a lot to learn. So yeah. talk to as many people, participate in as many things, start broad, and then gain exposure and experience so that over time you start to say, based on some actual practical experience, I don't really enjoy that. I really find this energizing and I want to do more of that. Or I'm learning about this, I'd like to get more involved in that. So I, I, I find this very energizing. I really love what I'm doing. Great, well, we're so get pleased you're here. here. We're so pleased for your service, as with all the other uh, veterans and current, those currently serving in the room. Um, without recognition, you can't solve the problem. I'd say not only recognizing what the problem is itself, we often think we know and don't really, and then those that need to recognize it need to recognize it. I think, and I've learned from my friends in the military, there's mission focus and mission clarity. Focus is, are we focused on the right things? Clarity is, does everyone understand the mission? One thought before I forget. Yeah, please. Because it's also not only acknowledging the problem. Yeah you also got to spend a lot of time up front. So tell me what we're trying to achieve. What's the yeah. objective? That's the mission. When you, right, concept. when you don't define the objective, you spend a lot of time spinning your wheels. And one of the things the military would often say to our political masters, because in our structure, we work right. for elected representatives right. um, of our citizens. We would often say, if you want us to do something, we need to understand the objective of the Why? end state. And you have to define that. Right. We can't do that. We'll give an opinion and input. Yep. But you, as a leader, you have to define that. And so you are now in the process of answering that question for yourself. Yes, I Why? am. Why? Mission. Values. Who am I? And what's next? Mike Rogers, thanks so Rob, much. Rob, thanks very much. For everything you've done. Nice, nice. Thank you so much. Nice. Thank you all very much.